Welcome to Look and Listen, a monthly program that explores the intersection of music and painting. I'm Masume Farhat, Chief Curator and the Ebrahimi Family Curator for Persian, Arab and Turkish Art at the Freya and the Sakla Galleries. I'm delighted to introduce Kio Tabasyan, a virtuoso sitar player a traditional Persian instrument, which is also the focus of this evening's program. Based in Montreal, Kia is also the musical director of the Constantinople Ensemble. Thank you, Kia, for joining us. Kia opened the program with a char mezrab, which is also an appropriate opening for our first painting, which is from a 16th century royal manuscript from Iran. At that time, Iran was ruled by the Safavid dynasty, which ushered in a period of tremendous wealth and artistic sophistication. It was also the Safavids who introduced Shiism to Iran. This manuscript is a copy of the Haft Orang, or Seven Thrones, by the poet Jami. One of the poems is called Yusuf and Zuleikha, referring to the biblical Joseph and Potiphar's wife. In this particular scene, you see Zuleikha arriving in Egypt to marry the governor. Now, she thinks that the governor is Joseph and becomes very disappointed when she finds out that he's not. But still, the marriage is to take place. And in order to celebrate Zuleikha's arrival, the entire city has come out to greet her. The entire painting pulsates with energy and you can hear the noise, you can hear the commotion as everybody is trying to get a glimpse of Zuleikha as she arrives on her gilded litter on a camel. There are two groups of musicians that add to the commotion. On the top, you have a group standing on the rampart. They are playing a variety of instruments, including um, trumpets, drums, and percussions. These musicians are part of the welcoming ceremony. Now, in the lower left corner, we see another group of musicians. This is more informal and seems to have been more impromptu than the group um, on the ramparts. Here we see a uh, player on the sitar, like Kia. We see one playing the camonche, a spiked fiddle. We see one uh, playing a wind instrument, and we also have a percussionist. Clearly, this is a very lively tune, as two youths are dancing away in front of the musicians. Now let's hear more about the sitar. Thank you, Masume. Um, I would like to say a few words about the sitar the instrument I play. The origin of this instrument goes back to uh, at least 1500 years before Christ, uh, when in the region of Shush in Persia of that time, uh, during Elamite period, uh, we found some statues of musicians playing an instrument very, very similar to this setar, uh, kind of a lute, long neck lute. Uh, so, and then in 10th century, uh, a great uh, scientist and musician, Al-Farabi, in his musical treaty, he speaks about uh, an instrument, again, very similar to this one, a long neck lute with three strings. Uh, called Tanbure Khorasan. Khorasan is the east region of Persia at that time. And so we can see that the origins of this instrument goes back to uh, centuries ago. And um, we can also see lots of paintings from 16th century that you can see in this video uh, with musicians playing uh, this lute, this setar. Um, setar in Farsi in Persian means three strings. Se is number three, yek do se, and tar is string, simply. Uh, so we call this instrument setar because it had three strings. And if you can look now to nowadays, from uh, 19th century actually, 
uh, a four the strings has been added to the instrument. Uh, four the string becomes between second and third one to double the third string. So uh, today's setar has four string, one simple string, second simple, and one double string. Um, the instrument has around 25 uh, movable frets made by gut. Um, we can move them to adjust the microtones that we use in modal Persian music. And uh, the technique of playing the right hand, of the plucking of the strings, is uh, with the nail of the index finger. So I don't use any external plectrum. I use my nail to pluck and resonate the strings like this. So from a very simple movements of right and left, we call rast, chap, to some complex uh, movement of right hand, we can have infinite variety of um, plucking uh, these strings, techniques of playing, plucking. Um, the material that we use to fabric to, to make uh, luthier fabricing, making this uh, setar, is um, the material that we use uh, to make the instrument is mainly uh, walnut loop, walnut wood for the neck of the instrument, and mulberry wood for the body uh, and the box uh, sound box of the instrument. And these strings uh, in the past used to be from silk and uh, from 16th, 17th century we use metal, uh, different alliage of metal to uh, make these strings. Uh, now we can look at some paintings from 16th century and to see how the setar, in which context the setar was played in some court uh, scenes. Thank you, Kia. In 16th century Iran, manuscripts with mystically inspired themes became increasingly popular. With their colorful stories, um, they told about uh, fairness, justice, generosity, and other virtues. And these stories were intended for all levels of society, but in particular for the rulers. And as many of the um, characters were um, governors, princes, and kings, the paintings also showed courtly scenes. Many of the scenes also include musicians, suggesting the importance of music at court, together with learned conversation, poetry recitation, and also elaborate banquets. In this painting from a manuscript also by the poet Jami, called The Radiance of Light, you see such a scene taking place in a beautifully tiled pavilion in a garden. You can even feel the breeze. A couple is seated in the pavilion and the musicians sit below. Take a closer look and you realize that all the musicians are actually women. On the left, you have a sitar player and a percussionist. But the sitar player doesn't seem to be focusing too much on her music as she is distracted by a passing handsome youth. On the right, there are two other women and they must be singers judging by their hand gestures. In front of the musicians, you have trays with refreshments and tall golden bottles, which are most likely filled with wine. In Iran, as in other parts of the world, Music was not only meant for enjoyment, but it was also intended to transport you to another level of consciousness. And that is why wine and music are often paired in many of these paintings. Remarkably, a number of musical notations from the 16th century have actually survived, and Kia is going to play one of them for us.
The piece that I just performed is dated from half of 16th century. We have traces of uh, music, Persian music of that time, uh, not mainly from, from Persia itself, not inside Persia, but from documents and manuscripts in uh, Ottoman court and uh, manuscripts from post-Byzantine period. It's a tremendous treasure, actually, to find these pieces and this repertoire of that, of that time in Persian music because um, the modal system of that time was different from what we are used to play in today's Persian art music a system of dastko. Um, system, musical system of that time was still a maqam system, uh, system a maqami. And uh, um, to have a light and to have the knowledge of knowing how the music of that time was, how the phrasings were, and how musicians were composing music of that time makes a real bridge between uh, what we know today and uh, the past of Persian music. Thank you, Kia. As Kia will explain, after the Safavid period, Persian music developed a system of melodic modes called dasgos. These dasgars are made of units called gushes. An apt parallel to this new musical mode is this remarkable painting from circa 1600. The painting depicts a seated woman absent-mindedly staring into a cup of wine. But look at her robe. It is remarkable. When you look closely, it is made up of figures all crouching together. Even though they look cramped and slightly uncomfortable, they are in harmony, peaceful, and each form is playing off each other. Very much like the gouches in Adaska, they play off each other and create a new ensemble that is striking, unusual, and memorable. Now let's listen to Kia playing one of the dasgars for us. And now I will improvise in a Persian mode called Avaz Afshari. I chose this mode because it's enough close to uh, the Maqam Bayati in which I played this piece from 16th century. But uh, the improvisation I will do is based on today's dasgah system. Uh, each dastka we have actually 12 mode divided on seven main dastka and five avaz, which are sub modes of those dastkas. Uh, each dastka or avaz contains different maqams inside. So uh, the change evolution of this system in 19th century to from maqam system to dasgha system, it actually a kind of a reorganization of the whole repertoire and modes. Um, and also you will listen, I will improvise, when I'm improvising, I play uh, many f musical phrases without a very fixed pulsation. So you cannot beat the, um, the time while I am playing. Uh, and sometimes I take some uh, pieces, some uh, rhythm, rhythms with a fixed pulsation and then you can hear uh, the rhythm inside the music. But uh, it's also very particular of Persian music to, uh, to have lots of musical phrases without these fixed pulsations. And uh, it follows kind of the, the, the follow on the po of the poetry, of uh, metric of poems. And uh, this brings also a different perspective to the sound and to the music that we can also find in paintings. So enjoy this improvisation in Avaz Afshari. <laughs>
Thank you, Kia, for such a beautiful rendition of Adasco. You can hear other sitar virtuosos. You can see other paintings with musical instruments if you go to our website, asia.si.edu. Thank you for listening. Thank you for looking. And we hope you will join us for another program in this series next month. Thank you, Kia.